We begin in Israel, a country I was reporting from just a few weeks ago. When I was in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv, I told you how the protests across Israel are almost unprecedented. So many people from so many different fields of life came together to try and put an end to the proposed judicial reforms and to stop the government from what the protesters feel was a severe weakening of the country's judiciary and an erosion of democracy. Now, the government and its supporters emphatically told me why they felt the reforms were necessary. In case you missed that, here's a quick recap. Now, what's happening? The, the, the executive is pretty much saying we should control the judiciary. No, the executive is saying the judiciary should have at least one check. The judiciary in this country is completely unchecked. There is not one check. In regular countries, in regular democracies, the judiciary has one check, which is the government selects judges. Now, I came back from Israel a couple of weeks ago, and in these weeks, the protests have spread further. More people joined in. It became stronger and stronger until it reached a climax where the power of the people forced those in power to bend their knee. I have decided to suspend the second and third readings of the law in this term of the Neset in order to allow the time to reach that wide consensus ahead of legislation during the next Neset. This way or the other, we will bring a reform that will reinstate the lost balance between the authorities while preserving, and I will add, strengthening civil rights. We will bring the reform, but not now. That's essentially the message from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And honestly, many people saw this coming, especially after that general strike was actually announced. And you had a situation where the Ben Gurion airport was shut down, planes were not being able to take off. Israeli missions um, across the world also were starting to go on strike. You had police commissioners marching on the, on the street. So it became clear that it was an unsustainable situation. After all, how long can one man, one man and a handful of his rather extreme supporters stand up against what seems to be the will of the people? And the will of the people was really, which was really paralyzing life on the ground. In some of the most dramatic protests in any democratic country, certainly as a percentage of the people who are actually out on the roads, Israelis left no stone unturned to put pressure on Netanyahu. Let me just show you some of the visuals that have come out of Israel this week. Look at that sea of blue, the wave of protests that swept Jerusalem this week. We saw Israeli commandos, Navy SEALs staging underwater protests against the reforms. It's not a matter of majority or minority, right or left. The people have spoken and have spoken and there's no one stronger than the people of Israel. The people of Israel made this point pretty loud and clear and their message reached not just the leaders at home, but also those outside Israel. The American president, Joe Biden, for example. So what do you hope the prime minister will do on that particular law? I hope, we, uh, I hope we walk away from it. And walk away he did, but only after invoking a story from the Bible, the story of the judgment of Solomon. I'm sure most of you would have read this or heard this at some point in your life. The story is about a king. He had to rule between two women, both of whom claimed to be the mother of the child. How did King Solomon decide who the real mother was? Well, he ordered that the child be cut in half. The woman who protested the ruling was finally figured out by, by, by King Solomon that that was the child's real mother. Netanyahu told the story to Israelis while announcing his decision to temporarily hold the reform. As for Biden's rebuke, here's what the Israeli prime minister had to say about that. Allow me to quote. Israel is a sovereign country which makes its decisions by the will of its people and not based on pressures from abroad, including from the best of friends. And we know who the best of friends was that he was referring to right now. Now, the big question that clearly we are asking, what is next? What's next for Benjamin Netanyahu? Now that the judicial reforms have been shared, what happens next? What happens to the protests? What happens to the bill? What happens to Netanyahu's coalition? What happens to his political future? Well, let's try and answer some of those questions one by one. First of all, the protests. Well, they refuse to die down. People are still out on the streets of Israel. Many say that they are now protesting the plan to establish a separate national guard. 
Now, let me try and add some context of that for you. You see, earlier this week, Israel's far-right Jewish Power Party said that the deal to delay the legislation would involve the creation of a national guard, one that is controlled by the party's leader and Israel's national security minister, Itamar ben Gvir. Simply put, this party is a part of the coalition government, and what it is essentially saying is the only way that this party will agree to Netanyahu's decision to delay the judicial reform is if the prime minister guarantees the formation of this national guard. And clearly, the protesters aren't happy about that either. Uh, ben Gvir, who is a minister in, uh, in uh, Bibi's uh, government, he, uh, he wants to have uh, a private police department only for him so he can, he can uh, uh, manipulate, not manipulate, maybe control the Palestinians and the left-wing uh, demonstrators. So uh, we are a part of the big demonstrations against the government. Now, question number two, what happens to the judicial reforms? Well, those reforms are very much alive. The reforms have been stalled, not cancelled. It's just a matter of time before the Netanyahu government pushes for clipping the wings of the judiciary once again. Now, when that's going to happen, no one knows, but they're very clear it is going to happen at some point. Now, question number three, what happens to Netanyahu's coalition? You see, the whole judicial reform idea was not really Netanyahu's brainchild, despite what it may seem like, given his ongoing probes and those questions around his particular personal future, the reforms were actually not a Netanyahu's personal priority list. The reform was one of the pillars Netanyahu's far-right coalition was built on. And now, its survival depends on what will happen next to these reforms. If Netanyahu decides to shelve it for good, his coalition could potentially collapse. If he tries to view the coalition, Netanyahu's government faces the risk of collapsing in the face of protests. In short, it is a catch-22 situation that Netanyahu's office and his political future hinges on. So what happens next? It's a question that is also underpinned by a fundamental dichotomy that I heard a lot about in Israel, and that is also the growing rift between secular Jews in Israel and the ultra-Orthodox. Yes, there is a rift there. The only cleavages in Israel are not the ones that you keep hearing about between the Jews and the Arabs or the Israelis and the Palestinians or Israel as a country and some of its neighbors. There's also a rift between the secular Jews and the Haredin, the ultra-Orthodox. Now, the ultra-Orthodox have been given various concessions in the past. For example, they don't have to serve in the army, unlike all other Israelis. Many of them they don't work, so therefore they're not paying taxes, but they're still getting allowances. And yet, they seem to be calling the shots. They're calling the shots in politics, as with the judicial reforms. And now uh, they're calling the shots with things like the settlements in the West Bank. Now, this is a divide that we must turn our attention to, because that divide also underlines a lot of what is happening in Israel.